Welcome to the FRIP VT live session for our Facebook group and my Patricia FRIP VT members. And this is one of the sessions that I think is probably going to in, be enjoyed by those who are with us live, certainly by those who will watch after and when we post it anyway, because we are with, without a doubt, one of the, I would say the most popular, but I have other friends who are humorists, certainly one of the most popular humorists in North America for over 2,000 2, times around the globe, people have laughed, learned and felt better because of listening to Tim God. However, Tim and I go back a long way. So before we give you the advice you tuned up to, Tim, why don't you tell our friends how we first met? Well, we, so were, we, were, we were at the, we were, wet, at the at workshop the in, in, in Bermuda. Bermuda. And, and I'm getting really bad feedback here all of a sudden, Paul. But we were at the workshop in Bermuda, and it was probably my first international event I've ever spoken at. And I was the timer. I'm sitting in the front row. We used to have timers. I don't think we do anymore. But uh, we had invited three people to get up and present, and they'd all been given a very specific amount of time. And they were talking about some of their best ideas, their legacy ideas, I think is what they called it. And the first two got up and went, each one of them went over about between five and 10 minutes. And before uh, Patricia had taken the stage, I went over and introduced myself and told her this is what I was gonna do. And she was very polite to me, <laughs> very nice. But it was like, I, you know, I, I don't think, you know, you're, it's, I don't know if I'm going to need this. And so she got up and did her program and I was stunned. She finished, she was the only one that finished five seconds or so before the the allotted time and I went up to her and I just had said I just I just could not believe she had been so precise and a few minutes after the event I was talking to another speakers and he looked at the watch I was wearing and he said is that a Timex and I said it is he goes if you had a better watch I think you would have seen she finished exactly on time and and that's the first time I mean you are you are spot on on time and we've been friends ever since well, then this was actually, there was one person you forgot because there were four of us. Oh, there were four. Yeah. Terry Paulson, Mark yeah. Sanborn, Joe Calloway. Ah, oh, yes, yes. And uh, I, I have a big house and a big office so I can keep items like that. That and was really pretty cool. Th that was fun. And what's nice for our audience to know is that how you really get started in NSA, because it didn't take long for everybody to know who you were. And this is what you do. You volunteer and you take non-glamorous jobs. Oh, if I'm not on platform, I won't take the job. You take jobs as timers or registering or That's whatever. Exactly right. Because it gives you access to the people that you're, you're helping. Well, but, and I can even tell you, I, I can track my process when I did the main stage, I had volunteered to be the program chair. Elizabeth Jeffries and Stephen Tweed taught, saw me there, met me, uh, recommended me for the Western workshop in Hawaii. And from there, I got put on the main stage. And it was only because I volunteered my time at the chapter. And it, it, in the, I just took off like a rocket right then. So. And that's it. You really are a superstar. Unlike me people though you actually can teach people how without going into lots of really complicated i mean people have written books on the 8500 techniques to get funnier but to take the story we actually have as mere mortals and make the stories that we already have funnier so without wasting any time, Tim, how do you take a story that we think is OK and make it funnier? Well, I, I actually had done a lot of this kind of just in my mind. And when I got married, my wife is a scientist and she said, we need to map this process out. And so we've spent quite a bit of time looking at it. And step number one is that you need to look at yourself and understand your own special qualities. 
Uh, do you need, are you a storyteller? Do you use a lot of props like I do? Are you, uh, uh, are you communicating with different audiences? I know, Patricia, you talk a lot with engineers. You need to look at the groups that you're speaking with and you need to understand your own individual style first. And I think it's critically important that you don't try to do a whole makeover. We just look at one area. And so that's kind of what we'll look at today. And, and then the second thing you do is you get a transcript of the story that you're working on and the video and then watch the video. And as you watch the video, take note of every single place that someone laughs and rate them like one through five. Is it a huge belly laugh? Is it just a giggle? Is whatever it is. And just make a mark and rate those alongside. And you identify what's funny. Then you identify, we'll look at why it's funny, about really what was the cause, what surprised the audience. And, and then you also look at what's missing. You know, when we're in a hurry sometimes on stage, they'll cut our time from an hour to 40 minutes and we butcher our own stories to accommodate that. But we need to look and see what's missing, what needs to be added. And it's at this stage where I find a lot of people are too close to their own stories, Patricia. I was coaching a guy named Ben who has a story about this gigantic, he was learned to scuba dive and he's got this huge sign that says, rule number one, be certified. Rule number two, swim with the buddy. Rule number three, tell somebody where you're going. And rule number four was never ascend without exhaling or you'll die. And I told him any rule that ends with, or you'll die should probably be rule number one. <laughs> and it, it's just that little turn that, that, uh, that was really important. And, you know, the other factors, you need to understand your audience. I was just on an agenda with a guy that tells a story about changing channels with pliers. And he didn't understand that anybody under 40 may not know what that is. They go, well, use the remote. He just, he did not connect with the audience at all. But the more you can identify your existing laugh lines, that's a key element because people don't take it to the next level beyond that. They're just satisfied with the laugh. And the, the premise here is area number three, and it's people look at stories like it's a documentary when they should be looking at them as if it's a film. Uh, I was in Melbourne, Australia, when Yossi Ginsberg launched his movie uh, Jungle, which is the life story about him, and just happened to be lucky there to watch it. And at breakfast the next morning, we we're all visiting, and he said, biggest problem he had was getting the screenwriters to do exactly what happened and they were trying to make it more into a movie. And I realized that's what we need to do with our stories too. They're not documentaries. These are the facts. It's moving from a documentary to a movie. And, and when I do this, I start now researching why the laughs occurred and how I can move that story from a documentary to uh, in an entertaining film. I start researching lines, I look at extremes, and I try to take the most absurd things that we could say and the most conservative and then come up with a little bit of an answer in between. And I'll show that more when we go through your story. Um, I look at props to see if anybody needs something visual. The, the rule with props are it has to add to the program and not distract from it. If you're just holding up a rubber chicken and shaking it, that's not gonna work put it in your luggage so that people leave your bag alone. Yeah, that works. And so, so we look at these things along the line and, and then I start looking at the delivery, the style. I look at uh, their facial expressions, that they are in the moment, as Lou Heckler says, that they're in the now. I look at them being present. Um, are they enjoying the story? And again, as Lou says, we don't tell and retell, we live and relive. And we start going through those factors until I get a pretty good understanding about why the joke worked, why it didn't. If we have international delegates, you know, certain things are going to be funny in the U.S. and not funny in other countries. Or you could say in Australia, but you couldn't say in the U.S. And so this is the process is number one, look at your style, understand your style. Number two, identify the existing laugh lines with your transcript. And then number three, we move it from a documentary to a film by adding 
uh, enhancements, a um, little bit of editorial license. And, and maybe the best way to do this, Paul, would be to just let's, uh, if we could just see a real short clip. Patricia sent me a video to critique, and I have to tell you something. As, as one of my idols, critiquing one of your idols is kind of hard to do, but, but this is a great story. If we can, can we show that, Paul? Absolutely. Good. And I'll tell you the, the situation this was in, in the year the NSA rocked, which was a wonderful year. Eric Chester was, uh, was the conference chair, and these programs, they had the young guns that rock and the, well, the legends that rock, people who'd been around for a long time. Yeah. And we all had 10-minute sessions. And so I told two stories, one which was a classic that I frequently use, who I did at the time, and, and then one that I'd only told a couple of times at NSA chapters because they knew the cast of characters. So... Uh, and, and certainly, uh, Paul will bring this up when it's uh, ready. And uh, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box. All right. The year was 1990. Mark Sanborn was still a single gentleman. Patricia in space. <laughs> <laughs> Stop and if I went to Denver, I'd come together for dinner in a comedy club. And this particular time... I'm not able to see it at this end, I just think, FYI. I can see it. I to speak at the same convention you are, and the four of us were going to have an evening to... Well, why, don't, why don't we do... Can you see and hear it? Uh, yes, yes, Tim, we can see and hear it. So okay. have an evening Sorry. join us for May. I'm not sure if I can pick you up, but I'll see if I can send some. I get off the plane and there is a young, handsome, buff, Chippendale looking guy, holding a sign that says Patricia Fred. <laughs> he turns it over and it says, I'm yours for the night. <laughs> Love, Scott Free. <laughs> I am thinking, I hope this is the gift. <laughs> <laughs> then he reaches down, hits a boombox, and starts dancing and stripping. <laughs> By the 12th bar, third button, and second hip swivel, we have a crowd. <laughs> Suddenly, dozens of less weary travelers are very interested in my chauffeur. <laughs> that is when I discover I have the ability to reach into my bag, open my wallet, separate the singles, fives, and tens without looking down. <laughs> By now, the crowd is chanting, take it off, take it all off. And when it gets really interesting, he suddenly stops and says, Patricia, I'm not really a stripper. I'm an NSA member. <laughs> and your point is... <laughs> No reason to stop, the crowd loves you. He said, those guys told me you'd be so embarrassed, you'd make me stop. <laughs> Perhaps you're aware that Scott Friedman is NSA's biggest practical joke. And for a while I thought he was having fun with me. And then I realized, of course not. They know I would never tell him to stop. <laughs> the joke was on the brand new speaker. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the first time I met your 
convention chick, Eric Chester. <laughs> Okay, Paul, thank you. It's a great story. Yes, and, and of course, with this crowd, they knew Eric Chester. They didn't know it was Eric Chester till the end. And so what we will also do is, in Paul, what you can do is put the link in the chat box and on the Facebook Live group so they can actually watch it themselves. And what I will do is I, I, I had this transcribed so I can send the trans a link to the transcription as well so they can see what the before is. So Tim very generously watched the two s stories. He likes them both, but we only pick one because of the time. And this is the one that wasn't told as often. Mm -hmm. And I gave him the transcript. So I just use rev.com. It's very inexpensive and send it raw and unedited to him. So now I shut up and tell me what you do with a story like this. Well, first of all, I thought it's incredibly well told and you had quite a few laugh lines. So what I did was I just concentrated on two or three areas to see if it was a fit or not a fit. But the first one I started with is when Scott told you that they were going to do male bonding yes. and you got a, you got a really good laugh there and you, you have a wonderful look on your face, which is exactly enough of a puzzle to let them wonder about it. But I researched male bonding and <laughs> And what you do is you, in the joke, it, depending on your comfortability, you would say, I researched male bonding and then go pause, uh, probably not like that, maybe in italics, because a lot of things popped up that, that I really didn't want to see. And, <laughs> and then uh, the first one is, is just say the very first thing it says is that meant in male bonding, the first activity was they would go to barber shops, which I, I was surprised it was number one, but your joke with that would be, I'm all about the salon, your back history. We yeah. could all go get our hair done and all have matching braids. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Number two, we could, the second most male bonding was watching sports while drinking. And so, you know, we could, I could sit there and drink beer and relive old high school days with the best of them and then hit the table whenever somebody scores, not even if I don't even know what's going on, but I can play. And then the third one was playing poker and smoking cigars. And so of those three, which one do you think you get the best laugh with? The salon, the sports while driving, smoking cigars, I would have thought smoking cigars. I think so, because you could just pause, look up like you've got a cigar, and you can male bond with the best of them. Okay, uh, hold that. I'm going to bring another show and tell, another prop. I don't use props till I'm around Tim God while you <laughs> keep talking. Okay, so, so along those lines is you look at the most extreme options available, um, and some of them were going to strip clubs and things like that. But but what we want to do is we just want to find one that's just a little bit. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. So, you know, that's not this. That, that would be really funny. The play poker and smoke cigars would be really funny, I think. And all you're doing is adding to that. Second thing I added for you is you said something either in the first story or the second, but you went hubba hubba. And I think that that becomes like a, a, a call. If you didn't do it, maybe I did. But it's a callback line that would be really funny is if whenever you pause and you look at it, Eric, you would say something like hubba hubba. Would you do that? Well, I could. I don't think I said it. I wonder if one of the <laughs> audience members did it and it came up in the transcript. Oh, okay. Yeah, hubba hubba. hubba. That's... Um, right. I think I could look at Eric Chester even now and say hubba hubba. And I think that if every once in a while, that's like your that's your callback line. Hmm. So saying at the very beginning and then as he goes on and you're I, I love when you're you know, we're talking about it's like as you're standing there watching him and and just saying hubba hubba, um, I think we'll get a laugh almost every time. 
Your next biggest laugh was when you said the gift that keeps on giving. And the only recommendation I do is let them laugh about that and really give them a long look. I mean, you gave me great advice when I was on stage, main stage first time, where you told me to give the audience time to laugh and truly enjoy that line. And then the next little piece that I wrote for you is, he gently sets down a boom box. Mm. So we need a little bit of context with that. And you could say, now the boom box was pre-iPad, <laughs> pre-Walkman, but post reel to reel. So, so and, and the wonderful way that you do this would be to get deadpan serious when you say it. You know, it's like, I think this requires a little bit of explanation. It was, it was pre-iPod, pre-Walkman, post reel-to-reel, -reel, right? <laughs> right in that narrow little rain there. And, and, and you didn't tell him what the song was, but so I Googled uh, uh, 1990s and 1991 dance songs, and the best one I could come up with was MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This. Oh, okay. Good. And the way you'd have fun with that is you could say, I was having so much fun that I didn't even want to explain to Eric that this is not proper, ga proper grammar. <laughs> that, that, that he, MC Hammer just uses a U, it's not Y O U. You know, it's be, you would say, you know, I've always wanted to let Mr. Hammer know that, that, uh, you you know that's not how you spell you and i think it would be i can't touch this would probably be the proper way to say it and so and then the second thing was uh can't touch this this is in specific and i think you'd have a lot of fun with that because yeah I, i'm not sure what mc is talking about with this he needs specificity i think would be i think it would be very 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 funny to do and so um, he starts dancing and stripping. Now, you really did well reacting in the moment with this, I have to tell you. But uh, um, what you would do is when he starts dan dancing and stripping, you just pause and go, have a have a. Oh. And they'll laugh every single time you say that. And then, um, then you say, we have a crowd. We have a crowd. Oh, oh, sorry, I missed one. Sorry. So remember when he's standing there with the sign and he's, I'm here, the sign says Patricia Fripp. Patricia Fripp. And then he turned it over. I'm yours for the night, love, Scott Friedman. And I have that sign in my underwear drawer upstairs. And I took it to the convention two years oh. ago and showed Friedman. He was having so dinner with with um, the Sharon Brocks, mm -hmm. and uh, I showed him I still have it. It's that, that is so. Well, so as people are starting to gather, you would, as people go by, you would point at the sign and go, "That's me, that's me." <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the other line I thought you could really have fun with is to go. This happens to me all the time. I can't believe this is happening again. And you'll get a you'll get a really really strong strong laugh on that. And then, um, and then he starts dancing and stripping. And then you pause and go, "Did I mention he's buff?" Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it was an NSA audience, you could say, "Imagine Tim Gard and Eric Chester." Then. They're not even close, you know. So, um, so then you've got a crowd, and then you say again, "He's here for me." Um, the crowd's changing; they're counting. Take take it off, and you go at the third button. That when he pauses and he says, "Patricia, I'm not a stripper. I'm an NSA member. You're here to." And then we'll add the line, "You're here to coach me." And you and you say, Eric, I want you to immerse yourself in the story. Be the stripper. Let's start again. Start with the third button. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Keep, keep going. Keep going. Um, I and I no. And then the other line is, I'll tell you when to stop. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. 
the great thing is that you close that off, that the joke, I mean, again, I think it's fantastic that the practical joke was really on Eric. Yeah. And Scott has been doing that to Eric for years and years and years. But um, the joke's on Eric. Um, and I, I guess, I mean, I thought the way it ended was really strong, too. But these little enhancements, Patricia, to me, they're just little things that you can add. And I recommend to people, pick one of them you like, put it in the story, see how it works, and then start adding the others. Don't do a makeover. I watch people do makeovers of story. They forget where they are, and they lose their place. But we can make small enhancements. And for you, this is true. But we're moving it from a documentary, which was funny as it is, to a film, which I believe is funnier. Good. Wonderful. Now, this I have only used a few times at NSA events. So how would I make this more generic to use for any audience where I had great rapport? So, so I, I'm thinking of one that would be an easy one, the American Payroll Association. I've just been for 21 years and I just, um, uh, I, I help them with their speaker school. So mm -hmm. I get, and one, one piece of advice I've given to everyone in, in the past is find a group that you can, that loves you, that you can practice some of the yes. new stories before you yes. take them out. That would be a good one. All right. Would, yeah. So with that one, it would be, you could talk about, you know, the first time I met Dan Maddox and okay. just say it wasn't as memorable as the first time I met Eric Chester. Yes. Okay, good. Good. Because actually Eric has spoken at APA as you have spoken at APA. Yes. It's just one of the funnest events I've ever been to. I love that place. Yeah, Steve Spangler really stole the show this year. Steve yeah. does that. Steve yeah. Steve is outstanding. Yeah. He 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 even out props Tim Gart. Yeah, he does. He does. Blow up. Yeah. yeah. No, anything that blows up in my show isn't planned. So. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, Paul, are there any questions from our members or are they just giggling along and writing notes like I am? Giggling along and writing notes like you are. Okay, perfect. Now, Tim, what most people don't realize, because obviously this is, and it was wonderful to give Sophia the credit, uh, being a scientist to help you look at what you do uh, even more analytically, because people are surprised how analytical really funny people are. Uh, to do this for a story like that, so that was about a four-minute story, if you were actually coaching someone to do this, it takes you about three hours to help That's them. right. Yeah, I, I spend an hour looking at their videos and getting to know them and looking at their style and, and really identifying what they will or won't do or what they're comfortable with. And part of that is we want people to dangle their toes over the edge of the stage just a little bit, but not too far. That they we, We've got to push the boundaries just a little bit. And so I spend an hour going through their materials, reading through the story, and then I spend an hour with them on the phone on Skype where we go through just like what we did here. And we try to find out what works and what's not going to work. And most of the time it's going to fit in well. But I did have one where the, the person told me, you know, Tim, this isn't a good fit and told me where. So I went back and just then adapted it into a different style. But we spend an hour on the phone going over what will, you know, what's happening. They get a recording of it. And then their third hour is they need to present the story a few times and then we come back and I'll go through with them what worked and what didn't work and why and about polishing it. So it's not a long process, but you know, Patricia, if you have a story and it becomes a signature story, that's a moneymaker, no question about it. And I don't know why people settle for a laugh when they can get hilarity out of the exact same story with just a little bit of work. Well, we all we all look at developing our content from our strengths and our points of view. And it is 
it's very helpful with someone anyone who has some expertise to look at what you're doing you know i look at a lot of engineers presentations and leaders and what would be obvious to you isn't quite as obvious to your clients or so for someone it's true i always remember uh do you remember an nsa member in the early days of when I was going to NSA, he was a star. He'd been with CNN, Robert Mayer Evans. Did you ever meet him or know him? I don't think I did. Oh. I don't think I did. But he was one of these amazing, well-established, great credential speaker that could talk about, a client could pick about any country, tell us about the political situation, about technology. Uh, I, I mean, just from his broadcasting background. And I, I admired him at NSA, but we were on a program together and we, we were, I watched his program. We would get in the bus back to the airport and he said, uh, Naomi Rohde says I should uh, tell more stories. And I said, well, yeah, where it fits in, Naomi probably be right. And then he said, do you think I should take a, a comedy writing class? And I said, your subjects are so thoughtful and current, I don't think that would be your best option. However, if you'd like, here are five five areas with exactly what you said that you could have got a laugh. That's exactly. Exactly. And I said, but what you did, you you didn't pause. Mm, to did pause. Pause so you didn't give people time to laugh. But I say you don't have a funny speech, but you have areas. So it's a matter of having someone look in and say, here's something you're saying. You're just not saying it well enough. You're not saying it long enough. Or That's correct. You don't have the punch well, word in the right place. The key to all this is consistency. Yeah. You know, if it's funny with the Asphalt Paving Association, is it also funny with Coors leadership or, you know, I mean, there's all these different, it has to be consistently funny. And I think that like a cubicle in the U S is a cubicle in Singapore is a cubicle. And you know, it, those are commonalities that we can use humor with and television and radio a uh, television radio and films have created understanding globally over certain areas of humor that we could use. But but, you know, Patricia, that's a great example. This is somebody who doesn't want to be a comedian. We don't want him to be a comedian. But they need to throw in a little bit of humor here and there. And the audience will be very appreciative. I guarantee it. And it will be unex it would have been unexpected. And so they'll laugh even more. Um, I spoke at a conference of seed germinators. And the guy that was on ahead of me says, let's put up that molds and spore chart again for fun. Just one more time. And I thought the molds and spore chart for fun. I mean, and, and people just laughed. And so, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of room, I think, for people that just take a, a little bit of work. And I think that uh, they could have amazing stories. Well, that, that's absolutely great. Paul, do we have any questions before I tell everyone good news? Not right now. Okay, good. Well, what Tim has offered to do, and we're going to work out the logistics for the FRIP Presentation Skills Facebook group. And we would throw in any of my FRIP VT members who also joined our, our Facebook group. He is willing to do for whoever wins our contest, he is willing to do what he just did for my story. So you would have to have a video of your story. You would have to have a transcript of it. And as I say, rev.com yeah, charge you a, a dollar a minute. And uh, then we will set up the deadline and, and you'll put fake, just as we've done with our other contests, you can post them on the Facebook group for everyone to evaluate. And then Tim will come in with another live session and go over the winners. So 
Yes. So we've had a few stories that we we can bring up those who are already in our archive if you want to resubmit them. And anyway, so that is very generous of Tim, because if you think for three hours of his time, uh, that is quite an investment for someone who makes big, 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 big bucks uh, mm -hmm. when he's out speaking. And we, for a mere mortal who's just a friend of yours as well as admiring you from afar, Tim, I'd say thank you for using your skills to help corporate clients and speakers like us make our stories funnier. Uh, the pleasure's all mine. Good. So I'm with this will be my last question of you before we wave goodbye. And certainly if you have any comments from watching this, if you weren't with us live, uh, I'm sure Tim will come in and, and answer them for you and we'll come up with the criteria for the contest. So uh, we'll good. tease you with that because Tim only just told me. So I want time to think it through. Uh, you say a cubicle is a cubicle wherever you are in the world. But when you go to, let's just say you're in Australia, because they vaguely speak the same language, is do you change any of the locations or the situations? I, I know uh, Tony DePaul, who was a friend of John Cantu's, went to Alaska to give a, a comedy, you know, a comedy show. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about when you're in Zim's at two o'clock in the morning. Well, they didn't have a Zim, so nobody no. laughed. Everyone knew Zim's in San Francisco. But when he found out it was Betty's Diner, everyone thought it was hysterical. Uh, so with it, your specific content, does that, uh, is there anything that you can adapt to make it personalized for Malaysia or Australia? Yes, you've got to be really aware of, you know, we have international audiences now, but when I go to Australia or Singapore, or these other places, you have to be aware of their culture and slang. I followed a speaker in Australia that was an ex-baseball player that said, we need to root for our teams. Well, that's slang for have sex oh, in Australia. Me. I found that out when I spoke there and I was talking about rooting principles for movies. I found that out after saying it, not before. Yeah. Um, Scott Friedman, when we were in Singapore one time, told a joke about sitting out front of his girlfriend's window honking the horn and she was so rude, she made him wait. It's a funny story, but in Singapore, nobody has a car. Everybody has taxis. You know, and they nobody can afford a car. And so he couldn't understand why they didn't laugh. Well, you know, we didn't know at the time. We didn't know any better at the time. So I do my homework. And it's why a lot of humorists don't like to speak overseas. Is there's a lot of nuances. And you have to do your homework. And when in doubt, ask somebody there. Yes. Uh, but that the guy that did the rooting, he couldn't, it was so built into his speech, he tried to take it out and he couldn't stop saying root. And the people knew where he was going, it was just hilarious. Uh, he is a technique that years ago, my friend John Cantu, uh, he had comedy writing classes, we became good friends. And uh, what when I was working at being funnier, you know, there were different times in our careers. I would, he would write some customized lines for me for each group mm. uh, or the characters. And then what I did from the customized lines, I came up with questions. It, it was like, and I would talk to the meeting planner and say, does anyone immediately come to mind? Like, who is the best dressed? You know, it's like, wool looks better on him than the sheep. You know, it's just, <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, and it was, who's a ladies man? Yes. Who, who, so for example, when I was working with Ford, we, they, there's one guy worked there for 40 years and I said, you know, still has all the original parts, which they, Ford thought was hysterically funny. Well, you can use that with other car companies. Yes. And then I found I could even use it when it wasn't car related and people still thought it was funny. So I came up with all the jokes he had written 
what was the setup and ask does anyone come to mind because i had so many at that point and even Cantu said you know i would never have thought of recycling customized jokes like that because you only needed two or three to make it personal but just like you said i learned I and, have... and luck is preparation meeting opportunity you know, we keep those lines in our pockets. Uh, I was on stage in Tampa, a fireman, there was a fire in the hall next to us. The fireman in full regalia runs across this room of 400 people, stands in front of the stage and just throws his arms up like, what are you doing? And then runs off the other side. And I go, did you guys see him too? And so, you know, it's, it's uh, you know that stuff's going to happen. Uh, and so... Um, keeping him every time I speak in Phoenix, I can remember Mark Sanborn getting up at one of the conferences there at NSA. And he said, the reason we're here is because the surface of the sun was already booked. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a great line. It's a great line. Yeah. Well, you and I could go on at this forever. We promised people we wouldn't keep them too long. So, Tim, I look forward to our second session after the contest. And you and I are certainly going to do this again for different audiences. So thank you very, very much for your generosity and your expertise. And do you have one walk away line before we wave goodbye? Laughter becomes you. Great. And you can, and Paul will make sure that everybody knows Tim at TimGuard.com. Yes. Or do you want us to email you at Comet Vision? Uh, no, Tim at TimGuard.com is fine. That'd be great. Okay, for any questions. And with that, thank you, Tim. Thank you, wonderful Fripp Fripp uh, Facebook group uh, attendees and Fripp VT attendees. You'll be hearing from us soon. And thank you, Paul, for the logistics.